thank you guys for, for joining me. Um, for those who don't know, I'm Tracy Gary, and I was a, a former Detroit broadcaster. I got implants in 1998. I had mystery ailments, illnesses for 20 years, didn't know. A gal down the lake informed me in 2017, it could be my breast implants making me sick. I removed them in April of 2018. I had over 40 symptoms, massive, like massive back pain. I thought I was going to have to have surgery. The symptoms were unbelievable. They're all gone. Once I removed the breast implants, all my symptoms went away except for some night sweating, but I, I have Hashimoto's since I've had since a kid. So I've been sweating since a kid. So I put implants in on top of an autoimmune disease that I didn't know that I had and created the perfect storm. The problem is implants are now linked to a cancer of your immune system. So women are getting breast implants and then they end up with autoimmune issues from the breast implants. And, and of course the medical community denies that, but really seriously, it gives you a cancer of your immune system. So use your common sense on that. Now, the reason for this is this uh, chat today. Uh, now, Tracy, uh, if I may jump in. Sure. Um, I just wanted to say hello to you. Thank you very much. Now it's important. I wanna go ahead and highlight one very important fact. You got your implants uh, in what year? 1998. 1998. Now, I just want to go ahead and clarify for the record. Back then, the, in 1992, the silicone implants were banned. And yes. so you could then get saline implants because they were determined to be safe. Mm -hmm. And so you got what were the safer implants. Uh, and they were absolutely not safe. And I just want to go ahead and highlight silicone implants are bad. You were the victim of saline implants and you got the same sign symptoms that a patient with silicone implant gets yes. and the same sign symptoms that a patient with ruptured silicone implants. And so one cannot look at your symptoms, those 40 symptoms. Uh, and like you have mentioned uh, before that I'm aware of, where, which included suicidal ideation along with the weight gain on all the inflammation along with these all these uh, uh, problems that you came in with. So it is important to mention that all implants are bad, including saline, and one cannot differentiate the sign symptoms from silicone implants and or saline implants, and that both of these should have been banned in 1992 because both of them are associated with these problems. I agree, and I was told they were safe. I was told they were a lifetime device that that I would be buried at 90 years old and they would be standing up in my casket looking beautiful and I would look 90, but those implants would still look beautiful, that one set. And then nobody told me that on the box they were supposed to re, be replaced within 10 years. Every 10 years, you're supposed to have a new set put in. I was never told that. I was told they were safe and they were lifetime. So it's not just um, the gel filled. I, I just met somebody who's got, who had cancer, a, a, a very rare cancer, she said twice, and they did reconstructive re surgery with implants on her. So I, of course, informed her of the uh, concerns I have. But the reason I wanted to have this today was we have BIA-ALCL, which is a cancer of your immune system that I just mentioned. But now in September, I believe it was, they came up with, I might sneeze here. They came up, um, yep, I'm going to, T Robin, tell them about the new uh, cancer. Well, oh wait, here goes my sneeze. <laughs> oh, I think I'm good. Squamous cell carcinoma, which is right a Dr. Khan a form of skin cancer. Correct. So squamous cell cancer. Uh, so just a little bit about myself. I'm a board certified plastic surgeon by the American Society of Plastic Surgeons. This is I know, the one I didn't and get only to, through board. My intro to introduce everybody. Sure, sure, sure. No, no, it is important just so you that you know, it is important to note that, you know, I'm a board certified general surgeon uh, by the American Board of Surgery. I did two years of burns and then I did a three years of plastic surgery and I'm board certified by the American Society of Plastic Surgeons. So I myself, I've been around cancer a lot uh, in the sense that as plastic surgeon and also we see uh, in a lot of patients that present with different types of cancer. Now, what is interesting about this FDA warning, this is a report two months ago in September of uh, 2022, where the FDA highlighted 16 patients that they put forth in their warning 
that there was this squamous, scale, squamous cell cancer that was directly associated with breast implants. So this was not like a supposed or a association. <laughs> this was a direct link, just like BIA-ALCL, right. which is the breast implant associated anaplastic Larsa lymphoma. This is a direct association with the implants, meaning if the patient did not have implants, she would not have gotten the lymphoma. So there is, this is a man-made cancer. This is an implant-related cancer. Now, also likewise, very interestingly, the squamous cell cancer association, i.e. a direct link with the breast implants was made. Now, one thing I want to highlight is the textured implants were associated or associated with uh, BIALCL, and hence they were banned by France, and then the U.S. soon thereafter followed the ban. Now, I want to emphasize the textured implants certainly are associated, but also the smooth implants too. So the FDA was very precise in their wording that smooth implants are also associated with lymphoma. Now, going back to the squamous cell uh, cancer, this is a very strange cancer in the sense that squamous cell cancer is not found within the body. This is the cancer usually found on the skin surface, for example, or someone, for example, has, you know, and again, in the medical uh, the world of surgery, patients will find this around the anal wall or around, for example, the mouth. So meaning wherever you have squamous cells, if I brush against the wall, I'm gonna basically scrape off some squamous cells. The endothelial cells or the adenocarcinoma are associated with structures like the intestine, for example, or the oral mucosa, for example. Uh, or for example, the squamous cells uh, within the oral cavity, for example, but very uh, unique in the sense that to associate squamous cell cancer with the capsule as a direct association with the implants was very bizarre when I heard of it, because it is, if you think about it, very rare of rare. Now, this was so concerning to me to the point where I actually called mm -hmm. the FDA myself and I had a chance uh, to talk to Dr. Dr. Corneliuson. She is the associate of uh, Bashar, Dr. Bashar, who is the head of the FDA, who is directly associated with implants. And I asked her, you know, you have associations of only 16 patients. Now they mentioned that this is a alert, a warning to the many surgeons so that they need to be aware that there is this association and that they should be testing and looking for it. Meaning that they should check the capsule because if it's not checked, then we won't know what it is. Now, the single biggest problem that I find as an explant surgeon and 99% of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis is associated with explantation. That is removal of saline and silicone implants and also residual capsules. The biggest problem that I find is the plastic surgeons are not sending the capsules off to pathology to do the CD30 analysis, to rule out the lymphoma, to rule out the breast cancer, to rule out the squamous cell cancer, or rule out any other problems. As you will see, fat necrosis, traumatic neuroma, among other findings have been associated with capsules, including from what I have noted, what are incidental findings. So just within the last three months, I have had capsules sent where they picked up on breast cancer on a patient. She actually went to Carmanos today to follow up with what is breast cancer that was found within the capsule. Fibroadenoma, which is the most common benign tumor. The, another patient that had a fat necrosis. And this is where if the pathologist is not checking for CD30 analysis, we are very likely missing on these cancers because they're gonna be underreported. So just to let you know, in my three years of training, when I was working with the 12 different hospitals uh, as my uh, fellowship training, I did not send a single capsule off to pathology because there was no indication or no need. And the general notion, unfortunately, is that the capsule will get absorbed by the body. So what if the capsule remains behind? and this is the body will accommodate slash learn to live with this coat uh, reaction to the implant. And there is no indication to remove it. Not only that, it is actually uh, 
challenge to remove the capsule and this risk should not be undertaken. Uh, now, one thing I want to mention before I will give, uh, I let you uh, uh, take it on. If there is any doubt, if there is a capsule that looks suspicious, the CD30 analysis must be done. If there is any fluid, it must be sent to cytology because if the lymphoma is not ruled out, we will not know what it is. And it is malpractice. It is bad medicine. If the capsule is not entirely removed, if there is lymphoma that is noted on pathology. I agree. I agree. Well, speaking of cancer, Robin, you had breast cancer, right? I did. I was diagnosed and with breast cancer in 2017. So tell, tell your story so I don't tell it for you because I'm horrified by your story. Yeah. So especially like was, watching Christina Aguilera, Wendy, well, I don't know if Wendy Williams ever had cancer. I don't think she did, but Christina Aguilera, I find very concerning right now that it oh, may very Christina well be Christina part of that could be her implants. Yeah. So I was diagnosed in 2017 and this was my third cancer diagnosis. So I just wanted to get it over and done with as quickly and easily as possible. Your third breast cancer diagnosis? No, my first cancer was at age 23. I had Hodgkin's lymphoma. And then over the years, I had had basal cell carcinoma four times, um, only when I had really bad radiation burns because the radiation that I had caused a lot of tissue damage. And then in 2017, I had breast cancer. Mm -hmm. So I chose to have a double mastectomy. I caught my cancer very early. Um, and- How did you catch your cancer, Robin? It was on a routine mammogram. Yes. So I just want to highlight again, very important. The most common is a self monthly breast exam. And I want to alert the listeners do not underestimate the value of the mammogram because it picks up on these calcifications before your hand even palpates a mass because sometimes that might be too late. So mammograms have saved millions of lives all over the world. Do not underestimate the value of the mammogram. Please go ahead, Robin. Yeah. I couldn't feel my lump. It was yes. only caught on the mammogram because it was it was pretty deep. So, so I chose to have the double mastectomy, and I really wasn't interested in reconstruction surgery. I just wanted to be done. I wanted a one and done, but that wasn't offered to me. I didn't even know that I could ask for it. It wasn't offered to me. I was basically asked what type of reconstruction I wanted. Um, so it was kind of implied that this is what you do when you have breast cancer and a mastectomy. You do reconstruction. So I had tissue expanders for three months and then switched out to breast implants. And I just, I just got so sick right away. I mean, within a month of having the implants, I had over 24 symptoms. So I within didn't a month, to, within a month. Oh, within the first week, it started with headaches, migraines, heart palpitations, dizzy spells, yep. difficulty breathing, difficulty swallowing. I would get rashes on my chest, rashes on my legs. My hair started falling out. My eyelashes started falling out. And I didn't do any other treatment for my cancer. I didn't do chemotherapy. I didn't do radiation. I didn't take any hormone uh, therapy. So I couldn't figure out why, why I was so sick. And I actually turned to breast cancer support groups because I, hadn't, I didn't know where else to turn. I had gone back to my plastic surgeon four times with complaints of pain, insomnia. I was 44 years old at the time, never had um, insomnia or sleep problems in my life, never had anxiety or depression. Um, I was feeling anxious all the time. My heart was racing. And her solution for me was she gave me pain pills, sleeping pills, muscle relaxers, and seizure medication. Oh, seizure medication. That's a new one. And I, it just, something wasn't right. And I, I just did not want to take a bunch of pills. I wanted to feel better. I wanted to feel good. Like I felt before I was diagnosed with breast cancer. I was walking five to seven miles a day. And with the implants, I couldn't even walk to my mailbox. So it was through another breast cancer patient that I found out about breast implant illness. And as I started doing research and, and joined like the, the online Facebook groups, I was shocked. And I was more shocked and angered that I went back to my surgeon four times and she didn't tell me any of this. 
My oncologist didn't tell me. My breast surgeon didn't tell me. My plastic surgeon didn't tell me. I had an entire team of doctors that failed me. Yep. Yes, no, I want to mention, you mentioned a lot of things, Robin, if I may, uh, may clarify. You know, the single most important group of doctors who directly deal with implants are the plastic surgeons. Now, I will tell you as a medical oncologist, radiologist, interventional radiologist, they are part of the breast center, the medical oncologist, all of these doctors, they are not aware truly of what is breast implant illness, even though they technically meet with them. Now, it doesn't take much. Remember in 1992, the ban occurred. So we knew if you go look back at the symptoms in the 80s, late 80s, these are the same symptoms what you're mentioning that the ladies went through. So it's not like we didn't know it's a new illness. No, we knew about it. The, the, the doctors knew about it, but more so the plastic surgeons than anyone else. Now, I'm going to say this as a board certified plastic surgeon. If a lady gets breast cancer, unfortunately, 90% of these ladies, the answer is augmentation mm -hmm. and augmentation with silicone implants almost always or saline implants depending on the choice very rarely with will a patient want to do a deep flap which is a deep inferior epigastric perforative flap or a uh, latissimus flap they might do a flap meaning using the body's own tissue to rearrange and kind of give volume to the chest and going back to the point you don't have any lymph nodes that were positive because it was caught very early on thanks to the mammogram mm -hmm. and what you went through, I just want to go ahead and clarify what you mentioned for some of the ladies who are not aware, you went through what is the tissue expander. Mm -hmm. So what happens is the general surgeon comes, they do the mastectomy, they remove the breast tissue, and then they do a sentinel lymph node. And then what they do is then the plastic surgeon comes in, makes a cut in the pectoralis muscle, and then introduces the tissue expander and they put in 50, 70, 100 cc's of saline directly into this tissue expander and then close the muscle. Then, the pla then you, just like every breast cancer patient, went to the plastic surgeon and every month or six weeks, they would put in 100, 120 cc's till the muscle, muscle would expand. And then you would feel the tightness and say, stop, this is uncomfortable. And then the plastic surgeon would say to you, come back in another month or six weeks. And then you would come back again. And because the muscle would now have stretched, atrophied, weakened, because remember, you truly cannot use the muscle. If you would use your muscle, remember the muscle sits on the whole chest and inserts into the humerus. If you would use your muscle, guess what? You would push the implant against your chest and it would be an awkward feeling. So already your pectoralis major was compromised. Then three months later, you had, I guess, three serial uh, expansions, if you will, the tissue was expanded. And now once it equilibrated and normalized, you then went to the operating room and then the plastic surgeon took out the tissue expander and put in what is the implant that you had, which is of silicone or saline, uh, which will very likely silicone, the, the one that you got. Now, I just want to mention in the vast majority of the patients who have cosmetic procedures, and where over 90%, 95% of the times the implant is introduced, it is put directly underneath the muscle in one hour or for very quick. And there is no serial expansion because remember this is cosmetic. And so what happens inevitably is part of the implant, maybe 300 cc, 350 is now covered by the muscle, which is cut. And the other half, or two thirds of the implant now hangs below the muscle because over gravity and when especially the flexion extension of the arm occurs, it pushes the implant down and out. So you will find many of the ladies will have their implant that migrates down and out towards the side, especially in those patients with the cosmetic procedure. Now, the point I'm trying to make here is you already have a displacement of the implant simply because there is no mesh or elderm or suture or anything that's holding it because over time, everything gravitates down. Now this becomes critical because as a board certified plastic surgeon making a cut in order to remove the implant and capsule, I make a cut right in the crease. Now 
I am going parallel to the muscle. I'm not going up and down. And this is a very important point. I just want to highlight so that your listeners, our listeners can see why the cut in the crease is made kind of a smiley face right in the crease rather than up and down because you want to be parallel to the pectoralis major and directly underneath so you don't compromise the muscle and that is very important so I just wanted to use that and help clarify that what you said that you went through the tissue expander so because many of the patients ask me what is a tissue expander my friend got that how come I didn't get it so I just very wanted to clarify painful, right very painful yes Extremely I was, painful. I was not shown what a tissue expander was, what it looks like, how it works in the body. Um, it's a, it, for me personally, it was, you know, I have a pretty high threshold for pain. Um, it was an excruciating process for me. And perhaps part of that was I had some prior radiation, you know, from my first cancer at age 23, but it was very uncomfortable. Um, I actually almost quit halfway through and, you know, was just encouraged to stick it out. I'm almost there. It's going to be so much better with the implants, <laughs> which was ironic because they were a hundred times worse. Yeah. So, so you had, Robin, you had radiation to your chest before because of the basal cancer? for my breast cell? cancer. For my... Oh, for the Hodgkin's. Yes. Got it. Okay. Yep. Yep. Got it. Okay. Now I will tell you, this is a fact. Now, if I ever, I am not sure, I will say I'm not sure, but a patient that has received radiation to the chest, and probably Robin, you know this, who receives implants, their complication rate is anywhere from 30 to 50% as far as dehiscence, infection, contracture, amongst the many other problems that radiation will cause to the skin plus the implants because the skin changes for the worse. It becomes more leathery. It is not an environment where you would want to put in implants. So that is very defined, that is very well published and established in medical and surgical literature. And they're not telling breast cancer patients that information. Right, right. Now I will tell you, I myself, as a board certified general surgeon, there are so many patients, look, they get immediate reconstruction with the implants then the lymph nodes come back positive. Then they are told you need radiation and they already have a tissue expander inside. And then they radiate an already tissue expanded, i.e. chest, which sometimes causes contracture, sometimes infection because of the chemotherapy that is almost always required. It decreases the white count. And now because of the infection, because of a foreign body, there is a hold in treatment of cancer because of the aesthetics now is given uh, priority, which is a big shame. This is where I have seen patients who unfortunately their chemotherapy was put on hold simply because they didn't want to lose the tissue expander. Right, yes. And it's, you know, the patient's health and safety should come first. And time and time again, I, I don't see that happening. I, you know, it's all about aesthetics. Even um, if you go back and look at the manufacturer's own original um, surveys that they sent out for patients that were enrolled in their, in their trials, the questionnaires that they sent out were typically asking about aesthetics. Are you happy with your breasts? Do you like the way your clothes fit? You know, is your sex life okay? Um, but nothing about the patient's health. And that's really where I felt like in my situation, that information was lacking. And, you know, I'm, I'm really big I'm a big advocate for informed consent and it's become my passion. You know, I passed an informed consent law here in Arizona for breast implants and um, we're working on legislation in several other states as well. It's important. And, you know, the, the, Tell them what the legislation is that you're trying, because I think it's very important because there are people standing in front of it and I think they should be ashamed. Seriously, they should be ashamed for trying to stand in front of this legislation. I don't understand anybody having an issue with this no please yeah, please no tell sense. us about the please tell us about the law that was passed in Arizona because that is important it is important so in Arizona i basically wanted every woman that's receiving breast implants in Arizona to know what i wish i was told so um, i actually developed a patient decision checklist and I, I started working on the chest checklist before Tracy and I went to the FDA in 2019. I actually brought copies of the checklist with me to the FDA, 
passed them out to whoever would take them because at the time I didn't know who key players were in the industry. Um, so I started working on it way back in actually 2018 and early 2019. Um, that's when I started working on the legislation in Arizona and the, the patient checklist has kind of evolved over the years. Um, we worked on it with a group, a working group in Arizona. And then I actually, um, our GPAC organization partnered with the American Society of Plastic Surgeons and we worked really hard on it for many months. Um, and I'm proud to say that the American Society of Plastic Surgeons adopted our patient checklist. They even put it on their website. It's still there today. Um, but unfortunately, the FDA rushed and put out a, um, without any input from any patient advocacy groups that I'm aware of, they went out and put their decision checklist that they're requiring for manufacturers. So, you know, it's unfortunate because our checklist that we use here in the state of Arizona and that we're going to be using in other states is more detailed. It gets into um, defining things like the symptoms of lupus, fibromyalgia, Hashimoto's, rheumatoid arthritis. You know, some women get an informed consent that lists those things, but I'll be honest with you, a typical 22-year-old woman or 30-year-old right. mom, she doesn't know what signs and symptoms of lupus is or connective tissue disease or fibromyalgia. And so they just initial their informed consent and they're not truly informed. The plastic surgeons aren't having that conversation with the patients, they're just not. And if they're not gonna have that conversation with the patients, then they need to be mandated to do so because those patients deserve that information. Not only because it's the right thing to do, but if patients do start to get sick, they can go back to that checklist and look and see, oh goodness, these are some of the symptoms that I read about when I was getting my implants. Right. Because Tracy of all people knows that most of the women in our community have suffered for years, even decades. Sick, sick, sick. Going and from some right out of the gate. Yeah. I was right out of the gate and it lasted 20 years. You don't 20, connect the yeah. dots. Huh? And, and Tracy shouldn't have had to, to suffer for 20 years. Right. Uh, one of my other biggest passions is getting the FDA to let not just plastic surgeons, plastic surgeons know about this. It's the rest of the medical community, rheumatologists, pulmonologists, cardiologists, all of these different doctors are still not aware of this information. The FDA has not issued an alert to let the medical community know. So Tracy, how many doctors did you have to go to? I probably went to six, seven different doctors. I have, I went to a back specialist thinking I was going to need back surgery and he couldn't find anything wrong with me, told me it was all in my head and then gave me a shot in my L4 area and my lower back. And I'm thinking, well, if you think this is all in my head, why are you giving me a shot in my back? Mm -hmm. But it was, it was the most brutal lower back pain. It felt like my back was absolutely broken for years broke I couldn't roll over in bed in the middle of the night if I woke up I could not I could not even move I'd have to sit there and then I'd put a pillow over my head so that my husband wouldn't hear me and I'd have to one two three and I couldn't do it like one two three oh it was it was awful he'd have to pull me out of bed and I'd be crying in the morning and I mean I know women that have seen over I haven't had it since since they took the implants out. It's completely gone. You know women that what? That have had visited over 20, 30, 40, 50 oh, yeah. doctors trying to figure See, out what's wrong with them. No, I, 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 I want to mention one thing. You know, if you ask me, what do I know about rheumatology? I'm going to say very close to zero. What do I know about measuring or treating blood pressure? Zero. Last, I've never treated because there's contraindication for some medications. If you ask me about managing diabetes, I will be very frank. I do not know. It's not my specialty, right? There's so many different classes. Now, I will tell you all these docs, the rheumatologists, the endocrinologists, the allergy immunologists, cardiologists, have they ever even touched the breast implant, let alone saline or silicone? No, I wouldn't expect them. So you're absolutely right, Robin. We need to i.e. the administrative societies and the society in general, teach these gateway physicians, be it the emergency room doctor or the family medicine, that there is such a thing called breast implant illness and that it indeed does exist. And you have to let the plastic surgeon figure it out. Plus, 
they themselves need to kind of attend courses or lectures, whatnot else, because, you know, this is a real problem with a real solution. Now, one thing I want to mention here, uh, Robin, that you mentioned, this is according to the FDA, right? And I want you to basically affirm this. If a patient comes to me or a patient goes to a plastic surgeon and says, I want breast implants, the plastic surgeon must discuss three things with that patient. Number one, the implants are not meant to be in the body forever. Number two, that the breast implants are associated with BIALCL lymphoma and cancers. And number three, that there is such an entity called the breast implant illness that from the psychological effects, neck and back pain, autoimmune issues, uh, you know, the dryness of the eyes, uh, you know, the endocrine problems, that there is a once the implants are removed, that there is a complete resolution, quote unquote, of these symptoms. So the plastic surgeon has to discuss, and I will tell you, there are so many patients, this past almost two years ago, there are so many patients that I myself have taken care of where there is no active discussion and no informed consent, where the patient truly understands or there is no frank discussion between the plastic surgeon and the patient in regards to the detrimental effects of uh, breast implants, both silicone and saline. Right. Absolutely. And, you know, it is unfortunate because when the FDA announced this in October of last year about this patient decision checklist, there's no, there's no legislation behind it. There's nobody policing surgeons to give this information. And I can't tell you, I have already had dozens of women come to me that have gotten implants since the beginning of 2022. And they tell me their, their doctor gave them nothing. Right. So, or maybe they got their implant card. And so, you know, and I'm, I'm sad to say this, but it has to be mandated. It has to be, it has to be yes. and there has to be a consequence. You get your, your medical license suspended. You do it again. It's revoked. Yeah. Because if, if they're not we, doing we took it, an oath to do no harm. Exactly. Yeah. So I'm very passionate about that. And, um, it, you know, it's unfortunate that we have to work so hard just to get the information into the patient hands, because it, it really is their right to have that information, to know what's going in their body, to know what it's made out of, um, and just to know what the risks and just make an informed and educated decision. It is no different than smoking cigarettes, right? We all know that smoking cigarettes can cause lung cancer. Does every single person who smokes cigarettes develop lung cancer? No. But every time they light that cigarette, they know the risk. They were aware of the risk and they made an informed decision and chose to do it anyway. So, but if you don't even know the risk and then you're being lied to and the, and the FDA is withholding this important, crucial medical information from the entire medical community, this has been going on for 60 years. I mean, this has been really common since the Dow Corning, you know, 1990s. Why are we still running across rheumatologists, cardiologists, pulmonologists, endocrine specialists that have no idea breast implants have this effect on the yep. body systems? It's not okay. It needs to be blasted out there so that doctors can help patients in a timely manner. How many patients have gone undiagnosed with a, with a cancer? This squamous cell carcinoma is a very aggressive cancer. Yeah. And unlike ALCL, it does not typically stay in the breast implant capsule. It spreads. It spreads to the lymph nodes. It spreads to the organs. It spreads to the tissue, to the breast tissue. I mean, this is an aggressive form of cancer. And I watched a presentation from um, Dr. Scott Glassberg from the American Society of Plastic Surgeons. He's the former president. He presented on SCC at the Breast Implant Health Summit this year. Um, which you were also on, Dr. Khan. And, you know, he told us this is a very aggressive cancer and it doesn't respond to chemotherapy or radiation. That's and, and 43, 42 or 43% of the patients were dead within six months. Yeah, within and those, six months. Yeah, those cases. They're not informing people. Yeah. See, the, the most important thing is the capsules must be sent to pathology because if it's not being checked, this cancer is being missed. And we all know a fact that the BIALCL, the squamous cell, all of this is way underreported. And they said there is some uh, disc, uh, the publications that mentioned that the peak is going to occur in 2026. Now, we, we have to also talk about the risk of 
silent rupture as well. Look at the manufacturers. Remember, Tracy, you were uh, with me almost like a month ago, and I read the mentor yeah. um, ad itself where they said in order to detect for a silent rupture, you have to get a MRI at year three after augmentation, and then every two years, they're onward. And then after 10 or 12 years, the rate of rupture starts to go up significantly high. And this is where, you know, the symptoms, the breakdown of the implant starts occurring and the patients start reacting. And certainly they're coming forth in the masses and the hundreds of thousands. And so this is very important to mention that someone has a change uh, in their exam, uh, then they have to seek consultation by a board certified plastic surgeon who agrees and understands breast implant illness. Now, this is what I say. If a patient comes to me and says, I need to get my implants removed, they are 13 years old. The general unfortunate answer by the plastic surgeon is, well, you look good. Why? If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Live happily ever after. And this is a serious problem because remember, it may look fine now, maybe a year later or two or three years later, the rate of rupture starts going up significantly. Now you have to deal with the rupture and silicon within the chest. And if it ruptures, it is very hard to remove. And so this is, again, the problem that I find that the patients come, oh, I was fine for 20 years. Now, all of a sudden I'm having pain. Why are you coming now? Or another lady, she was 33 years into her augmentation. She lived through the Dow Corning. And I said, well, you had a chance to remove. She said, I actually signed a waiver in 1992 that I did not want them removed because I really like the way I look. And now she comes because she has a grade four contracture and a rupture because now the implant finally ruptured for her and she just couldn't bear with it. And she said, I just want my health back. Now for her, it was these many years later, who knows, this might have been going on for the last five years, seven years. As you are aware, the many Facebook lives that I do, there was a case I did just seven years into her augmentation, she had a rupture. It was a silent rupture. I didn't know about it, neither did the patient. Her exam was very unremarkable. And she was just seven years into her augmentation and she was hurting. That's so, such an important one thing, point. Tracy, I, yeah, uh, please go ahead, Robin. Well, it, you know, there's so much conflicting information coming, especially from the other plastic surgeon society, you know, that it's not necessary to remove capsules. I mean, they were just talking about that with this new study that came out, but then the FDA announcement just completely dismissed that study because how can you say it's not necessary to remove capsules when that's where the cancer is developing in the capsules? Right. So. But that's how are you going to how are you going to pick up? Yes, yes. Yeah, and it's so unfortunate that the actual leaders of a plastic surgeon society would would, would dictate that, and right. and you know that's that's frightening to me, and so, it's very so, dangerous. So, so, yeah, so th what you mentioned, Robin, uh, is very very important. I want to just highlight this happened just today, Wednesday, the sixteenth my patient came from the Netherlands. So all the way from Europe, she saw me, she followed me on Facebook. She had textured implants put in, in Europe in 2012. And in 2020, she had the implants removed because of the many symptoms of what she was BII. Her plastic surgeon did not believe and does not believe in breast implant illness. So he removed the Implant. Breast implant alone, leaving the capsule behind. Now she continues to linger with these many symptoms of breast implant illness, where to the point where she said, I'm tired of taking these medications like band-aids that suppress the symptoms to an extent or make me sleepy. She's fatigued along with the many sign symptoms. The other thing is just wait and do nothing. And she's been through a lot of other doctors and tests and whatnot else, which all yield even an MRI, that there's nothing wrong with the chest. Today, I did her surgery. This was a residual capsule. Two years later, I removed. It was a very much intact capsule directly on top of the rib underneath the muscle. And it was a challenge to remove in this young lady, a 29-year-old lady from the Netherlands. And this is the biggest problem I, as an explant surgeon, I'm facing right now. There are so many surgeons who do not believe in breast implant illness. Mm. Number two, there are some 
plastic surgeons who want to be politically correct and say, of course, I believe in breast implant illness, but at the same time, they're augmenting. And I'll tell you, it's, uh, you cannot have it both ways. The third thing is, well, uh, the third group of plastic surgeons, okay, I don't believe in breast implant illness, but I will offer you the surgery because you know what? I can do the surgery. Now, when the going gets tough inside the operating room, the surgeon himself or herself says to her ego, I am going to leave the capsule behind because I don't want to risk her life. I don't want her to get a pneumothorax. So what if 20% or 10% of the capsule remains behind? I will cauterize it or I will pulse lavage or irrigate it with three liters of five liters of saline. That's not good enough. The capsule itself has to be physically removed eliminated, deleted, basically dissected off of the rib such that there is no capsule remaining behind because that is what it takes for the patient to bounce back to normal state of good health minus these toxins. Look at pathology after pathology report. You will see there are breast implant particles. There are capsular uh, debris from basically within the capsule. There's debris from the implant breakdown that continues to hurt and haunt and cause the silicon toxicity because of this gel bleed phenomenon. And now, despite removal of the implant, you have what is silicon that remains within the capsule that continues to hurt the patient. So it is imperative, this is the whole essence of explant surgery, that the surgeon needs to wholeheartedly, sincerely believe, number one, that breast implant illness is real. Number two, that the recovery of the patient lies in removal of the implant capsule plus all inflamed tissue directly off of the rib, which is the hardest part of the case and to remove any masses, any abnormalities and send it off to pathology so we can rule out the squamous cell cancer, lymphoma, breast cancer that was diagnosed in my patient uh, a couple of weeks ago, for example, or any other problem so that the patient has a peace of mind that there is nothing inflamed remaining and that my surgeon wholeheartedly took out all the capsule because he believes or she believes in breast implant illness. And now the patient has a fair chance to bounce back to a normal state of good health, minus all these toxins. And that is what is explant surgery. Absolutely. And you know, important to point out also, we have had patients whose doctor did not think it was important to remove the capsules. So they, they removed the implants, left the capsules, and those patients were diagnosed with ALCL years later. One year later, two years later, and six years later, because those capsules were left in. Yep. Right, right. So if you look at my oh, Facebook the science. group page, yeah, yeah. I, I just posted for the discussion that we were going to do today, Robin and uh, Tracy, I just posted this case report that you just mentioned and many of the cases where the implant was removed, the capsules remained behind. And now in the case report, four years later, the patient developed the BILCL, even though the patient has no implant because the capsule remains behind and the capsule was not tested. And that is a serious problem. Yes. So good point, Robin. Very nice. This is important. So the capsule, what is the worst thing that's going to happen if the capsules are sent? Nothing. You at least have the peace of mind that there's no cancer because we won't know. And that's why it's underreported. Mm -hmm. you, have you always sent to pathology? So uh, from the very beginning of time, I have always sent to pathology because I won't know, I cannot grossly look at any tissue and send. So today's case, the same lady from the Netherlands that came to me, I found a small mass, which I knew clinically is consistent with a lymph node. I sent that off separately because remember, if there is any tissue, the lymph nodes basically harbor the malignancy or whatever, because there are the first set of cells where the so that we can rule out cancer because it may not be in the capsule but it may certainly get picked up in the lymph node okay. and not only that I send a hundred percent of the time the capsules off to pathology to rule out the BILCL rule out malignancy squamous cell uh, CD30 analysis I take cultures for aerobic anaerobic and fungal and you'll be surprised 10 to 15 percent of the time I have cultures that come back positive for bacteria. Three of my patients, their cultures came back positive for mold. And I always send these patients with the mold to infectious disease so that they can get complete workup. 
And then I always return the implants to the patient. I always take a video and pictures, high definition of the chest yeah. showing complete removal of the capsule. And I do the twilight anesthesia, which is basically no general anesthesia, no paralysis. The patient's literally like a colonoscopy sedation. To date, not a single patient has woken up. The patient protects her own airway and the risk for clot DVT is essentially none. And this is what is very safe, effective anesthesia. And the other thing I do is, as you and I have discussed Tracy in person, this is not the time where the dissection is done at the level of the rib, if you will, the basement of the house, which is the hardest part of the case underneath the muscle, which is where most of the implants are. And this is not the time to be doing a lift, which is all at the roof of the house or at the surface at the nipple areola when the breast tissue is very inflamed. So this is how I do it. And I've done it consistently without the need for drains. So this is very important. The last time I used drains was almost two and a half years ago. In any of my patients, be it saline or the many patients with silicon implants, even the 800 cc's, and even with the many patients with the ruptured silicon implants as well. I have to say, you're, you're one of the most passionate um, breast implant illness doctors that I've ever crossed paths with. We've got a lot of passionate doctors, but honestly, I think... I think you're one of the most passionate. In fact, it was in my intro to you, which you're so passionate, I didn't even get to introduce you, that you um, paid your own money out of your pocket to run ads on Detroit television, which just blew me away to warn women about breast implant illness. And then I saw you go on uh, channel four, I think it was, one or two different times, I don't know how many times, to just go on and warn people about breast implant illness. Also, you've removed butt implants, haven't you? Can you talk about that? So calf implants, now remember- Oh, you've the, removed the calf? Calf implants, I have removed chin implants. Um, now, uh, the, the, the buttock implants, I have not removed. Uh, They're very difficult I have here because- I have, Yeah, I have the- the, the patients have not come my way. Most of the times I find that the BBL, uh, what they call the Brazilian uh, butt lift uh, patients, I've managed because I have never done. So I wanna make sure, and I wanna go ahead and highlight to my patients and anyone who's listening, the Brazilian butt lift is a dangerous operation. Mm -hmm. It's Brazilian, banned, right? Yeah, yeah. No, it's not banned. Believe I it thought or not. it was banned in some countries. In some countries, that is true. But in the US, believe it or not, it's a very popular surgical procedure. Oh. Now, now, so this is again for the record. The BBL operation is the most dangerous plastic surgery procedure done by a board certified plastic surgeon, period. Number two, it is replete with problems, including infection, loss of sensation, fat necrosis, which means that 20, excuse me, 40% of the fat almost is going to die. So if there is injection of, let's say, 300 cc's, 500 cc's, 40 to 50% of the fat is going to die, and the patient is going to have clumps of irregular matter. Now, this is the most deadly operation that is done by plastic surgeons to the point where, at one time, the mortality, the fatal rate, the death rate was one out of 3,000. Then there was a consensus by the plastic surgery uh, societies and they said and concluded that you know the fat that is put in sometimes can go into the bloodstream and then travel and affect the lungs and oh cause God. death as a result what they call fat emboli so they came up with a consensus about safer ways now I will tell you this and I say this very humbly and very <clears throat> uh, professionally the Brazilian butt lift which is essentially fat grafting to the buttock area is the most dangerous operation still. It should be banned in the United States. Any professional, honorable plastic surgeon should not, must not do this procedure. It carries with it still a lot of risks and it is not worth doing it for the many patients who unfortunately are young and naive and truly don't comprehend the risks of the procedure. And if you ask me, the plastic surgery societies and the board of uh, uh, medicine should step up and actually ban these procedures. If you ask me, that would be the absolute right no-brainer thing to do. 
I thought they already had banned them. I, I, I'm disappointed. No. I thought they already had. Can you just tell me, you just said that it can travel the fat that they're, 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 so like we have women that get um, their breast implants removed um, and then they yes, get, yes. they get the yes. fat sucked off of the, you know, their stomach and butts and everything. And then they have it injected into their breasts to plump them back up. And, and I have a friend of mine that does that after her breast cancer and she loves it, but I almost did it. And then I, of course, the support pages, I love support pages. I love all of our breast implant support pages. And then one of them was a fat transfer page. And, and I read all these people who loved it, but then I read all these other people who had complications from it and it scared me so bad. I decided it wasn't for me. Plus I can't handle pain. Robin's good with pain. I am not good with pain. I'm a, the biggest wimp. So that changed my mind and I didn't do it. But are you, are you under uh, the impression or do you think that when they're injecting that fat, is that also capable of traveling to the lungs and stuff like, like the Brazilian butt lift in, injections? So absolutely. The risk is there, relatively speaking, less so, less so. Now, uh, and most of it doesn't hold anyway. It gets correct. absorbed so, and these right, women right. end up, and, the, and it's it's brutal pain. I mean, the liposuction. It's expensive. Yeah, it's a gal, expensive. I was down in Costa Rica and the gal across the hall had done it and he lipoed her whole, you know, the back and everything. And we shared a taxi to the um, to um, hyperbaric chambers and she was in the most excruciating pain and she was all doped up. And she was still, she couldn't even hardly walk. It was, she yes. was in so much pain and then it didn't hold. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm, I'm going to say it. this. I'm going to say this, Tracy. And uh, let's talk about this in a little bit more detail because this is a very, very important point. Fat grafting to the face, Coleman technique, you inject three, five, seven cc's of fat into the cheek area and you do a fanning technique. 30% of the fat dies. Now the best blood supply in the whole body is on the face. So remember, we want the blood supply to be in and around this fat that is being spread out and fanned and thinned out such that it will take. On the face, 30% of the fat dies in the best of the hands. Now, if you take the same fat, maybe inject into the breast area, fifth, you are looking at 40% to 50% of the fat is going to inevitably die, especially in these patients who have breast implants removed. Remember, this is an inflamed area. Now you have fat, let's say they inject 150 and say 40%, let's be generous, 40% of the fat dies. Now, guess what? You have 150 cc's is not a lot. If you look at a Coke can, it's roughly 360, 375 cc's. So it's not much. So now you have almost half of the fat that's going to die. Now, I myself have seen patients, including this patient that came from the Netherlands today. She had fat grafting. If you felt her chest, she has these clumps of fat necrosis. That fat that's scattered all over the chest. Now, I will say this, and I'm going to make a very bold statement. It is malpractice, malpractice, bad medicine, where one out of eight or nine women who are going to get breast cancer who feel the most common way to look for breast cancer is to check for a mass. And now she has a distortion of her self monthly breast exam because of this irregularities, nodularities, sensation changes, and you have parts and areas of fat necrosis that will linger on years and years later for almost 70, 100 cc's of a volume where breast cancer now is gonna be missed because this lady is reluctant to get a mammogram because it hurts or she gets a mammogram and now there are, what are these irregularities, calcifications or abnormal uh, masses that are now picked up. Now, sometimes you can tell fat necrosis on an MRI, but now that becomes a challenge for the patient. She will inevitably miss a breast cancer mass because she might think this might be fat necrosis. And now again, what Robin was saying earlier on and what you were alluding to earlier, in the name of cosmesis, breast cancer, one, of a, one out of eight or nine women who are gonna get breast cancer in the United States, their self monthly breast exam is altered, is not uh, to the point where the patient will be able to get a self monthly breast exam. And now the patient may have delayed breast cancer or undetectable, or she may just choose to delay till 
it may be more advanced. And now the patient is getting radiation or chemo because anyone who can deny whatever I just said, I want to challenge them. I want to take them for a debate. Uh, you know, I want them to challenge whatever I just said, because this is common sense. Don't tell me it's safe. Fat grafting is not safe. I will see a fat grafting to the face. Go for it. You know, still it's dangerous, but what you get is an excellent, beautiful result because this is permanent. You don't have to get fillers every four to six months. It works and it works beautifully. This is what I would say it truly has changed the way uh, aesthetics to the face has been practiced, but fat grafting to the chest, absolute no. Fat grafting to the buttock, absolute no. And this is what my stake is uh, as far as fat grafting goes. Robin, um, thank you, Dr. Khan. Robin, I, I'm very proud of you because you never need to get a mammogram now. And I want you to tell everyone why, because I think that's a, this is another very important option that women are not told about. And, and Dr. Khan, I've seen you do, um, I think you've done flat closures but on women, but I've seen you do um, breast reductions on men who, who had, what is that called? Masto? G gynecomastia. Thank you. And Men I've seen, I've you seen your before and after pictures. Some of, I thought a, a couple of them were women. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, no, it, they it, had it, breasts it, like women. And it, by the time you got done with them, it was the chest of a man. And it was really quite impressive. So Robin, can you tell everyone why you don't ever need a mammogram again? And, and or, a I bra. Just, <laughs> or a bra. And I'm no so proud of you. No bra. No. I'm so proud of you for, for that too, for spreading the word about this. Cause it's so another, when I explanted, I chose to stay flat, you know, and at, at that point I was so done with boobs in general. I just wanted to be done. Um, but also, you know, I'm very comfortable being flat. It's, it's easier to exercise. It's easier to be physically active. So, and, and it was one of the options that was not presented to me. And, and I will say that our flat community has grown so much in the last five years. When I, had breast cancer, yeah, when I had breast cancer in 2017, I, I, did, I don't think anyone was even really talking about it. If they were, I wasn't able to find them. Um, Kimberly Bowles is a huge flat advocate that has done amazing work um, in getting language changed. Uh, also, Andrea and I changed. We were able to uh, meet with NCCN and get the NCCN guidelines, the clinical guidelines changed for wow. breast cancer patients. So if, if a surgeon has a patient and they're, and they're diagnosed with breast cancer, the NCCN clinical guidelines now state when you're giving their surgical options to include aesthetic flat closure. Wonderful. That was a huge win for us. Um, and just the community and the way it's grown and just the beautiful women that are out there that are just really sharing their stories and empowering other women to do the same. I'm really proud of, of, of our whole flat community and the movement that they've started because you know, it's not for everyone. Reconstruction isn't right. for everyone. It's about choices and it's about informed consent. Exactly. And when women didn't even know that they had this choice, you know, it, it's surprising that I think there's a stigma attached that most women want breasts and it's not true. I mean, almost, almost half of all breast cancer patients now are choosing to just stay flat. They're seeing the horrors of reconstruction surgery. They don't want to have 12 surgeries or 22 surgeries. And, you know, honestly, as we're talking about malpractice and just being ethical and moral, you know, what plastic surgeon is okay with continuing to perform 27 surgeries on a breast cancer patient? At what point do ethics kick in and say, you know, honey, this might not be working out for you. Right. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's really a shame to see that, you know, and at some point the woman has to decide what's best for her health, what's going to be best for her body. Aesthetically, I don't even know how after that many surgeries, you know, the results can, can come out pleasing at that point. Um, so it is really sad for me to see that in the breast cancer community, but again, it's about choices. It's about informed consent. And I'm just really proud of all the women out there that are sharing their story and just getting the word out there. I think it's it's great to see and it's empowering I, other women. I don't think people realize the massive amounts of support pages that are now flowing on Facebook and Instagram. Is, well, Facebook, I don't know about Instagram. I don't know how to work Instagram, but um, Facebook, there's numerous support pages. And so there's one for everyone. If you don't, yeah. if you don't 
think you fit in in one or you're not getting information you need in one. I mean, there's one called the itty bitties, like, because you, you remove, like, I'm totally very small. I mean, minor. So, it, you know, you have to put yourself in the mind of, of women. There's a reason why I had a complex, you know, and went and got breast implants. And then you end up with these beautiful breasts and then they made you sick and now you're back to flat again you're right back to the mental state where you went and got them and it's a lot for women to handle now that is true now I, we, this is very important because if you look at the ladies as they get older they realize it absolutely was not worth it sometimes and a good number of times as you will see the ladies never wanted it. It was the significant other who was yeah. the driving force, unfortunately, who was funding and financing the whole surgery itself. And I find, you know, this is a very serious matter. Now, if I tell someone, and again, if you get implants, you could get cancer. You could, they last only 10 to 15 years. So if it's a young lady, Mm -hmm. who is in her 20s, is she going to get replacement six times in her lifetime, right. let alone all the problems, contraction, yeah, infection, bad. asymmetry, right? And then the breast implant illness symptoms. Remember the need for MRI for silent rupture, according to the uh, manufacturers themselves. Can I ask you a quick question about MRIs? Yes. Are there dangers yes. getting MRIs all the time too? There is there radiation? I mean, are there good. any risks to MRIs because if these no, no, women good. are having to have them so often, that's a concern. No, no, no. Good question. So the MRI that is done to look for a silent rupture for silicone implants, there is MRI stands for magnetic resonance imaging. Okay. So there is no radiation and there okay, is no good. contrast. So it doesn't hurt the kidneys. No contrast hurts the kidneys. And so you're just like in a radiation, uh, uh, in a magnetic resonance imaging chamber, which is the MRI machine. There is no radiation, okay. zero radiation. And so you could get a, a newborn into an MRI machine and it won't hurt. Okay. Um, but, you know, you may have to sedate the baby, obviously, but in this case, it's a one hour or so to get the. Uh, now, in those patients that need to get an MRI to look for breast cancer, then you have to put IV contrast. Mm -hmm. uh, but if the lady has silicone implants and you want to rule out rupture, that's MRI without contrast to look for a rupture. And that is very benign safe. Can an ultrasound pick up a rupture? Ultrasound is technical dependent, technician dependent, and it is sound waves. And sometimes if we have a very thick wall of the capsule, the sound waves may not be able to penetrate. So it is better than nothing. And it's a very crude test, just like a mammogram. Mammogram, remember, looks for calcifications. You have a screening mammogram, then you have a diagnostic, then you have a 3D, you have different types. So the mammogram is looking just for breast cancer. The ultrasound is looking maybe for a cyst to better define, maybe looking for like a quick, crude, non-invasive by the bedside check, which can easily, easily miss what may be a rupture. Now, even the MRI, which is the best test that's out there, can sometimes even miss uh, a, a rupture. One day I did a case where there was two back-to-back -back patients, both had MRIs, the MRI on the first patient said it's ruptured and lo and behold, it was not. On the second patient, it said it was not ruptured and the implant was ruptured. So what were coincidence? Yeah. I have a problem with mammograms um, with implants in and, and I have no explanation of why I got a rupture after 12 years. I, I had saline, so I woke up and it was just flat one day, which then that all traveled through my body. All that, all that, could have been moldy or you don't know. Um, but I had no explanation what caused that. And I often wondered if it was sticking my breast implant into a vice grip every year and having them smash it when it keeps continuing to deteriorate over time. So it's breaking down and dissolving. You've seen it a million times, Dr. Khan. So then we're sticking them into a mammogram machine and then you bust that capsule open possibly. And then there goes all, there goes all the issues flying out into, into these women's chest walls. And I, I have a hard time with mammograms when it comes to breast implants. I don't, I don't think we should be doing them. What are your thoughts on that? So number one, we heard Robin a mammogram literally no, with got implants the, in. No, no, yeah. So I'm okay they, with yeah, them yeah. without implants. It's right, with right. implants in. With Why implants, are we sticking yeah, them yeah. in a vice grip? Right. So a patient who gets saline or silicon implants on any given day is traumatized with pressures, 
be it a car swinging open on a windy day, riding a bike, another person hitting, or uh, just basically being on a roller coaster and being bounced around. Plus, there's so many, like a kid, for example, I had a patient that came to me and she said, my four-year-old child ran towards me and kneed me on my left breast. And ever since then, I've been hurting and I can tell it's ruptured. And believe it or not, she was absolutely right. It was indeed ruptured. Now she said clearly, everything was fine till my four-year-old son came and he literally kneed me right in the chest. And it was the most painful thing that she had felt. And she said, I, my breast was never the same. Now I'll tell you, I believe her story that this was a direct result. Now, every day we put ourselves, even us, our hands through so much trauma, right? Now, yes, when you go and check and get a mammogram, now fact, millions, of patients all over the world have had mammograms with saline and silicon implants and they were not ruptured, correct? Now, there are many, no, this is a fact, you know, every single day all over the world. In but Europe, did they in rupture Africa, like six months later? That's, you know, did see, it I just, so There is it no, there is did no it correlation. So, so, so there is no correlation. There is no correlation between a getting a mammogram and getting a rupture, but there is a correlation between not getting a mammogram and getting breast cancer being picked up late. So that risk is there. Now, hopefully you get rid of the implant so you don't even have to worry about, because remember, there are so many patients, their mammograms are red and the mammogram report says, because of the technical deficiency of getting the mammogram because the technician felt uncomfortable or the patient didn't want to, they got an incomplete or a substandard study. That has missed uh, you know, uh, cancer. And sometimes the implant is so large or grade four contracture that they truly are not able to uh, do a mammogram on the breast tissue that they're able to see. So that is a compromised mammogram. So there are so many mammograms that are done that are not effective simply because of the fact that the implant is getting in the way. Now, there've been studies that have been done that show, well, these same ladies, they have breast cancer that's picked up more because these are the patients they may have insurance versus the other patients who do not, for example. Now, at the end of the day, you have a distortion of the chest. So to answer your question, mammograms are absolutely mandatory. There are millions of patients who have had mammograms with implants safely and there is no direct correlation between patients getting mammograms and a direct rupture that same day or even three months later. There is nothing in literature. I dare you to find anything or myself. I have not read anything that states that there is a correlation or a study that has been done. Now, okay. if a patient says, well, I don't want it, then talk to your doctor, go to the breast center and at least get an MRI because you don't want to miss breast cancer. Right. Um, you mentioned capsular contracture. Can you can you explain? Because we sit there and tell, oh, you got to remove the capsule. We've been saying this whole time. You have to remove all the tissue, all the capsule. Can you explain what a contracture is? Yes. So let's talk about a capsule. Anytime you have any foreign body in the human, be it a pacemaker in the chest for uh, cardiology reasons, be it a lab port for lab gastric uh, bypass or a hip, or in this case, a breast implant, be it saline or silicone, the body in itself mounts a response or a scar tissue, in this case, a capsule around. It identifies it to be foreign. Now with the pacemaker, it's stainless steel or titanium, it's inert, meaning it is, it's metal, right? Or I have five screws here in my little finger, titanium from a car accident. It's not reactive. The body itself, it's, it's, it's hard. It's not leaching uh, copper or zinc or whatever it may be, titanium, because this is why they chose this hard substance. I wish they make implants out of titanium because then they won't be reactive. But the point here is that now the capsule forms now, remember what we talked about earlier, the implant saline and also silicone. And especially when the silicone is ruptured, mm -hmm. it's leaching out silicon particles. The body itself then forms and tries to entrap. Now, sometimes they can get calcified. Sometimes the capsule forms thick uh, boundaries and kind of grows strongly in order to protect. 
Sometimes it may be a very thin capsule. Now, each one of these capsules doesn't signify if this is worse disease or bad disease. Sometimes liquid, i.e. Uh, 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 a fluid forms around. Now that is raises a red flag for lymphoma. Now, going back to your question, that capsule is the body's response to a foreign body. In mm -hmm. this case, the silicon implant. Now that harbors in it, the silicon particles. We know this because look at the pathology reports. So it is imperative to remove that capsule because in it are the silicon toxicities, the impurities that continue to hurt the body despite removal of the implant. So this patient today that came, she had residual capsules. And we know from a whole series of patients who have had implants removed and capsules left behind that they continue to hurt till the patient goes to another plastic surgeon who removes the capsule sincerely, definitively, and now the patient bounces back. So these capsules must be removed. Now the capsular contracture, you have basically four different grades where the highest grade is where you have thickening and distortion of the chest wall as a result of the implant being suffocated, tightly compressing the implant and the patient has pain. And you'll so see a lot of, you can tell, you'll see, you can always see it in a woman. Right, right? Irregular, yeah, exactly. So this yeah. may be riding up high or to the side and it is so tight and you can go to my Facebook page or any of the YouTube videos and you can see the example where it is so tight, suffocating, compressing the implant. Yes. And there is pain because that might be in the proximity of a nerve. So that's grade four. Grade three, you have this hardness, this irregularity that you're mentioning, but no pain because it is in a soft area. And then grade two, where you have palpation and the distortion is really not there. Okay. And grade one is where you have normal uh, symmetry and uh, normal exam essentially of the chest. And you can Google this um, uh, uh, capsular contracture, what they call Baker's classification, grade one, two, three, four. And you can see these highlights and pictures. You can also go to my page, I define it, or go on YouTube, Google images, and you can see that as well. And Dr. Khan, do you have time to take questions? Yes, or, yes, absolutely. I don't know what your time, right yes. I don't yes. know how, how, what kind of time you have. I know, Robin, you might have to scoot, but can you tell us really quick, you started GPAC, and I wanted you to tell everybody what GPAC was before you go, and then we'll take questions for Dr. Khan when you're, after you go, because I think you have to scoot, right? I do in a little bit. I've got okay, so whenever you've got to go, you just, you just go, but I wanted to find out about GPAC. Tell everybody about GPAC first. Yeah, so Terry Diaz, um, I actually met her at the first FDA meeting that I testified at. She runs the Florida Breast Implant Illness Support Group, and together we started GPAC, which is the Global Patient Advocacy Coalition. And we basically, we work with anybody. <laughs> we work with surgeons, we work with other medical professionals, we work with societies, the FDA, TGA, Health Canada, B Farm, you name it. Um, we'll talk to anybody about this. And just our goal is to raise awareness about breast implant safety and also proper informed consent and just to overall improve the standard of care and just make sure that patients are being protected, um, protected and informed and that the medical community is aware of, of these things that are going on. So that's kind of what we're all about. And it's it's been great to work on legislation. It's been great to work on the patient checklist. And it's just been an honor to work with so many great people and just meet so many people that we would never have met otherwise. So it's an honor to be here. I think you're doing great work. Yeah. Okay. Now let me ask you, let me ask you this, Robin, because it's very nice that you know you are along with Tracy, you know, what would be the leaders that will translate what you know the patients voice to the FDA. Now, let me ask you this. What is it going to take from your experience, Tracy and Robin, you can both answer for the FDA to step up and say, you know what, we're going to take the leadership role, Dr. Bashar, for example, and say, you know what, implants are bad. And we're going to take that executive decision where we're going to take the implants off the market, hopefully both saline this time and silicon and say, we're going to ban the implants altogether. What is it going to take uh, for the FDA to do this, they're re they're ready to um, launch another brand. They're they're not they're not gonna they're not stopping. They have no intentions I, of banning them. No, I don't think it's gonna happen, honestly. Um, and it's really unfortunate. And I, I, 
and I'm not trying to make light of the situation, but you know, romaine lettuce <laughs> is notoriously pulled from the shelves because 39 people got diarrhea, you know, mm -hmm. but we have literally women being diagnosed with cancer and dying from ALCL, from squamous cell carcinoma, from other T cell, B cell lymphomas, um, you Suicide. know, but yeah, yeah, we've actually had several in our community that, that have um, completed suicide, but it's, it's sad because there's a lot of money at stake. Yeah. A lot of money for a lot the of legal kickbacks too. a lot of manufacturer money going on. And, um, you know, a lot of the, if you look at some of the society leaders, they've taken hundreds of thousands of dollars from the implant manufacturers. The FDA itself gets um, the majority of its funding from user fees from the uh, medical device manufacturers. So, you know, it's, Round and round we go, right? It's just the system, honestly, wow. is broken. It's the the approval process is broken. The 510K process, which is a loophole that uh, medical devices use that, to get their products on the market, if they're even remotely like any other product out there, even if those products have been banned or recalled, um, you can still get a medical device approved. So, you know, the reporting of adverse events, you know, luckily the, the FDA stopped allowing alternative summary reporting. But when we went, when Tracy and I went to the FDA in 2019, it was discovered that very week that the FDA was hiding over 446,000 reports of women harmed by breast implants. Wow. Yeah. Now, this is, this is very alarming. You know, like how can you hide or how can you justify this? Then what's the point of reporting? So yeah. what's the point of, what's in our the meeting point of reporting in our meeting last week you know we had made it very clear in our meeting prior to that that the fda thought they the words they used were that they had broadly communicated breast implant information um and then you know we crunched some numbers we found out how many medical professionals are in the united states we found out how many um what target audience their announcements reached and we showed them that they were not doing a good enough job getting this information out there. Um, but they made it very clear, the information's not coming. It was even suggested that us patient advocates put the information out there mm -hmm. to wow. the medical community, which of course I'm trying, but I don't have access to 5 million medical providers, nurses, doctors, mm -hmm. societies. Um, and, I, and I told them that. I said, you know, we don't have the tools in our toolbox to be able to have that kind of reach of that broad of an audience of medical professionals. So um, it really is unfortunate. And, you know, I, I have been having meetings for about the last four years with the FDA and feel like we've been heard and, and um, you know, that the patient perspective has been respected, but that was truly, there's no reason I can think of whatsoever why they would not put that information out to help patients. I mean, they're literally delaying care proper and timely care of patients. They are literally delaying cancer diagnosis, timely cancer diagnosis that can be life-saving if caught early. Well, they tell women, oh, if you have the textured implants, don't worry until you see symptoms. Don't yeah. remove them now as a precaution. Wait till you get sick. How that does that make sense? Yeah, that does. And, and it goes back to Dr. Khan's point earlier. At some point, we have to think of common sense. Look, I get it. I mean, there are millions of women that have those allergen biocell texture devices in their bodies. And you know what? It would be mass mayhem, wouldn't it? If they all decided to run to explant because they were worried about developing cancer. But, you know, we should have been more cautious. The medical community should have been more cautious when they were running around the country and the world promoting those allergen implants as the gold standard, right. the new textured allergen devices. I mean, the leaders of one of the societies were the clinical investigators on those implants. They told us those implants were safe and effective. They told us those implants were the gold standard. And now they're recalled worldwide for causing cancer. A lot of those same people are on the clinical trials for Motiva, the new breast implant that's coming to the market with the microchip in it. So, and right. those are the same people that are telling us don't remove the capsule that's not necessary. Yep. At some point, we all need to pause and think of common sense. And does that make sense? Does that make sense that we know now some of these cases of the allergen uh, texture devices 
they have a chance a now one in like 387 um, chance of getting ALCL lymphoma. You know, we have to pause and think about that. And then the recommendation to leave those in the body until you show signs of cancer is just ridiculous. And it's another concern is them using mesh in the breasts. Mm -hmm. A whole it's other exactly like breast implants, and they're putting them in their breasts now. Now, what have you uh, seen in regards to the insurance companies, Medicare, uh, taking basically footing the bill for an explant if the patients, for example, develop contracture or sign symptoms of fluid collection or pain, BII symptoms, for example? What is it, is it going to take? for the insurance companies and the, the government, the, 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 the Department of Health to mandate what is an ICD-10 code for breast implant illness, such that the insurances will ultimately cover this explant surgery? You know, that's a really difficult question. We actually submitted proposals for an ICD-10 code and um, same group of people that thought it wasn't a good idea. Um, so it's unfortunate that the patient safety aspect is not being taken seriously because if there was an ICD-10 code, you know, we would, we would have more women that were able to get insurance coverage for this, mm. but it's, it's really highly stated that these are elective devices. Now, breast cancer is different. Um, breast cancer, you know, due to the Women's Health and Cancer Rights Act of 1998, breast cancer reconstruction and explant are all covered um, by insurance. I will say this, since I've been doing this in 2017, I am seeing more insurance companies that will help cover explant due to pain, capsular contracture, um, like you said, a seroma, especially now with these cancer announcements. So we are seeing insurance companies cover that more and more. Unfortunately, most plastic surgeons enjoy a cash pay business. So they typically don't deal with insurance companies. Their office staff doesn't even know how to deal with insurance companies because most of their patients are cash pay. Right. So now I will, I will mention, Robin, as a plastic surgeon, having dealt with insurance. Now, I want to take this. The number one reason for bankruptcy in the United States is not foreclosures. It's not student loans. It's the medical bills mm -hmm. by far. Number one, fact, medical bills are the number one reason for bankruptcy. The entire health industry in the United States is in turmoil. N nowadays, the surgeon does not get reimbursed. So if I were to reimburse and say, for example, submit the claim to the insurance, if I do get paid, that's number one, if. Because they say, if I go get a facelift and it goes bad and you get an infection, and I go to the emergency, like, who told you to get a face lift? So everything that comes from that complication is yours. And this is what they majority of the time say. Now, let's say they're being generous enough and it overlooks the committee. Remember, they don't even look or open or read. And believe it or not, they automatically deny coverage without yeah. even opening the file. Yeah. So vast majority of the, Now, I know this because it goes through. I see these patients, right? And there are patients that get reimbursed. Sometimes they get reimbursed and then six months later, hey, by the way, we paid you an error, give us the money back, believe it or not. So I've seen that happen too. Now, in those cases where let's say they do cover, they say, who told you to remove the capsule? That was not required. So just removal of the implant, $250, $550, $750, $1,200 on average. That's it. That's all with the cover. So I just want to go ahead and make it absolutely clear. If a patient says, oh, I found this nice surgeon, he believes in BII and he's gonna take my insurance to do an explant, I will tell you 100%, not 99, 100% that surgeon is gonna do an incomplete job, be done with the surgery in 20, 30 minutes, remove the capsule, maybe rupture the saline implant or just pull it out, leave the capsule behind or maybe partially remove the capsule and he or she will not spend more than an hour removing the implant. And I'll tell you as a board certified plastic surgeon who 99% of my practice is exclusively explantation. It takes me four hours to do an explant. And I'll tell you two thirds of the time I'm running over the four hours. And this is a surgery where it's not about 
the time. It's about whatever length of time it takes. So any plastic surgeon, be it at the university setting or a private cosmetic setting who says, I take insurance and you don't have to pay a dime or even a co cool amount, that surgeon 100% will do an incomplete bad job, i.e. he is not fixated into removing the whole capsule. And now the patient if he asked me, will only potentially be hurt because now let's say if it's a ruptured silicone or if they ruptured the ceiling in order to pull the implant out, which they do all the time, then that patient now has to deal with what may be a ruptured silicone within the chest or residual capsule, which is relatively harder to remove, like today's case. And now the patient has to suffer and now undergo another surgery unnecessarily. Now, this is not like maybe, maybe this is 100%. So, you get one shot at this, do it right, do it definitively, do it completely. And I will tell you, to if any person, i.e. plastic surgeon who takes insurance, that's a recipe for chapter 11. I, I have seen some surgeons that are taking insurance and I've seen the, the, you know, the patient will share on, in the Facebook groups, pictures of the capsules and, and, and they're feeling better. Um, and a lot of the patients, I think what they end up doing is filing on their own after like they'll pay the plastic surgeon for the surgery and then afterwards they'll right right which is what surgery. i do yep. mm -hmm. yeah and, no, and i've seen i've seen women get it covered i help women out i i people call me all the time and ask how to do it and what codes are used so you know no, by all means submit but for no. the surgeon to say i'm going to take only your insurance and you don't have to pay me that a surgeon will not, because you cannot justify a four hour surgery and only get compensated $800, $1,200. Because just to open an operating room and a board certified facility where everything is done up to the standard. Remember at my operating room, I have a certified first assist, a certified surgical tech, a certified facility itself, just to maintain, just to open up a room is $800. Yeah. You know, how can you justify it? Plus you have to pay your fee. You have to pay the, the, all the, the costs of running a practice, which nowadays has absolutely increased compared to two years ago. Everything is going up. And the point I'm trying to make here is even let's say, for example, a colonoscopy, right? Do you know how much in the state of Michigan, this is at least two years ago, how much does a gastroenterologist get paid for a routine screening colonoscopy, no polyps? $205.76. How much a gallbladder? How can you, even let's say if I did 10 of these, right? For example, uh, colonoscopy, you cannot justify uh, having a full practice. Even if you have an assistant or a fellow, you cannot justify in today's uh, you know, if you go to a family medicine doctor, look at the explanation of benefits. You're going to find they sometimes get paid $35, $62, $89, not more than that. And now, unfortunately, the entire hospital system, and I will use this platform, is a money-making enterprise at the expense of the patient, at the expense of the doctor, the it. hospitals are big mafia institutions. You walk into the emergency room, just from the time you sign in, you go in, you got a $2,500 bill, just basic routine. And they will overcharge, double charge. I, I, I know friends of mine who work in the emergency room, they were told, give an incentive spirometer so we can charge $25 because if you buy one for $2 and we can charge, or the, the Tylenol pill or an X-ray or an EKG. Or and the fifty-two dollar box of Kleenex. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. And, you know, I, I while we're talking about medical, and I do have to run, I have to jump off in a, in a couple of minutes. But you know, um, when Allergan issued their voluntary recall, and you know, I think they wrote a statement or put out some kind of statement saying if a patient does get in uh, diagnosed with BIA ALCL, um, they receive seven thousand five hundred dollars, and that is a joke. That is such a slap in the face to cancer patients because anybody who's been diagnosed with any kind of cancer knows that just alone biopsies, imaging, labs, that's the bare minimum of a cancer diagnostic, diagnosis. And then you get into surgeries and, and any other ancillary things that come with it, treatment, chemotherapy, radiation, you're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars and you yourself brought up the point most people file bankruptcy due to, you know, medical bills. 
for Allergan to offer $7,500 is, that's just abhorrent. And it's sickening to yeah, see how know, hard the, If you know, Robin, you're in this as well every day. You deal, talk to the patients. Let me tell you this. I had a patient, she had insurance. She was hand to mouth. And I said, you know what? I will do you at the hospital the day before. This is typical, by the way. I get a, we get a call from the, in, from the insurance carrier that we're canceling because this is not, this is, esen, this is not essential surgery. This is for a cosmetic. I then call, and then they said, you can go ahead and ask for a peer to peer review. So I requested for that. When I talked to the doctor and I said, do you mind, after like a minute, I was like, do you really know what you're doing? So I just asked him, do you, what is your expertise? What do you do? He said, I'm a pediatrician. Oh my so gosh. They, they, and, and I will say this, they hooked me up with a pediatrician to make the call if this patient should get an explant or not. Now, I'm not making this up. I actually mentioned this doctor's name. He's in Florida. And I asked him, are you even practicing? You know, sometimes, you know, you may get like an illness or you just, you cannot practice, but you can give medical advice or, you know, you, the insurance companies love you because you're paid to say no. Just last, so and let me give you another story. So this is the world that we live in, unfortunately. It's all sad. Now, the pediatrician told me, can you send me literature on BII and why you need to take the capsule. I said, this is not my burden. This is your burden. And I said, I'm going to record this conversation just like you're recording mine. And I'm yeah. going to play this tonight on my Facebook live because I was doing one that day. And he said, you cannot do that. And he literally hung up. There was another surgeon out of Beverly Hills, California, about a patient of mine who took a FMLA for eight weeks. The so they denied coverage for the FMLA. They said, you should be back at work in two weeks. Now the insurance company had hired this plastic surgeon to speak on their behalf. Now this surgeon is putting an implants board certified. Now, when I called the surgeon and I'm very good, I said, I'm, this is my responsibility. The patient is, I'm not, I'm not charging the patient anything. I said, I'm going to speak on behalf of the patient. So I called the plastic surgeon and I said, why is it that you're denying the implant was 450 cc's below the muscle? The pectoralis has to settle. It takes six weeks or so of recovery time, and you're just allowing two weeks. Then I talked to this doc and I said, Who are you? What's your specialty? What's your training? And he was an internist. I said, You've never even stepped foot. The last time you were in the operating room was when you were a medical student. And how are you making wow. a decision on behalf of this? surgeon, um, you know, in Beverly Hills, this is Dr. Feroz to name him. Now I said, shame on him that he gets paid. He gets paid to say no because the insurance companies love him because now he has, there's no check and balance on him. And unfortunately you have a series, this is all about money. And that is unfortunately the reality of it. So now going back to the point here is any surgeon who will spend four hours, five hours, whatever length of time, certainly more than the three hours and get compensated six, $800. You cannot justify the intensity of the surgery and the time and the commitment plus the expertise. You know, how many patients have asked me, why don't you get like a co-surgeon or another person who can, I said, I don't trust the other surgeon into removing the whole capsule because within their heart, they would not want to remove it. Right. I do want to, before I jump off, I do want to thank you and all the other explant surgeons that are taking really good care of our patients that are committed to removing implants properly, no matter how long it takes. Um, I know that it was really hard for all of you to kind of step out there and put your neck on the line and speak out about this. Um, just since I've been doing this for the last five years, I've seen some of the bully tactics that have gone on with, with you know, your peers and your colleagues, but nevertheless, we still have a really great group of explant surgeons who are continued to committed, to being committed to taking care of our patients. And I want you to know 
how immensely appreciated that is in our community because when Tracy and I still every week, I had a woman come to me. I, I had three women reach out to me just today, but every week we get women that come and when they find out about all of this, they're frantic. And their first question is, how do I find a good doctor? Mm-hmm. And for those of us who watch and pay attention and put our time into this community and our effort to get to know the doctors that are doing it the right way, we just want you to know we appreciate it. And you know we're just happy that we feel comfortable in a place where our women have options. Our mm-hmm. patients have options to make an educated choice. Um, so thank you for that. Thank you for your time tonight and just all the time you spend with our patients because I know in that three or four hours that it takes for you to remove implants and capsules, I know that down the street there's a surgeon right in your town who's popping in 10 sets of implants yeah. and a heck of a lot more, within, more money. Within the time, it would be f- at least three or four implants that you would put in. So it's four times. Now, I will say this, Robin, you know, I appreciate your you know, nice words and your kind words. I will tell you, I, as a human, as a physician, as humanity, right? This is the right thing. This is a no-brainer, right? This is just like you would. Would you ever hurt or cause harm to someone and financially benefit off of someone else's misery? Because this is essentially, especially given the mountain of evidence we have, right? This Mm -hmm. is no like, we're like in the 60s or 70s. We're reliving whatever the same set of problems in the 90s. And I will say this, it's sometimes I find, you know, the, the, the root cause of evil is money. And I will tell you what goes around comes around. You know, I believe in karma and I'll tell you, yes, I would be three times, four times richer financially, but Mm -hmm. I will tell you the contentment, the happiness, the peace that I have into going about and just speaking my mind. Today, I spoke my mind. I have no ill will against anyone except for the benefit of my patients. There is nothing, if anything, you know, this is where, if you just look at the facts alone, if you look at what we did talk about, we talked about facts, it is no denying that there is, the implants only hurt the body. They do not belong in the patient's body and they need to be taken out before they cause more harm. And that is the whole essence of explant surgery as well. Thank you so much. We appreciate you. And, um, I'm going to pop on tomorrow and check out the questions to see, um, cause I'm, I'm dying to know what, what questions we have tonight. So thank you everyone for allowing me to join and thank you, Tracy, for having me on. I appreciate thank it. You for, thank you for having Thanks for Robin. Us. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye. Love you. Good night. Keep Love the you. Good work. Thanks. Bye-bye. All right, Dr. Khan, we have Evelyn who says she was 15 minutes away from electroshock therapy treatment. She was so depressed. I, I actually sat there thinking I, I was Googling electroshock therapy. I was so severely suicidal. I was Googling electroshock therapy, just like her. Glad I didn't do it. My friend- no, no, I, I want to say this to the patients and I want to say this to the significant others. Implants take a toll physically on the chest, but if you ask the mental toll of depression, anxiety, emotional instability, abrupt anger, uh, suicidal oh, well, ideations, mm-hmm. this is, a very real problem. You know, the psychologists and the psychiatrists need to understand this is a integral part of what is breast implant illness. I had co- I had contacted that Dr. Amen or Amen, I don't know how you say his name, A M E N. And um it was it was seven thousand dollars, I think, to get a brain scan, but I was convinced like there was fluid or something from the inflammation up, you know, causing this suicidal depression. And I just couldn't pay. I, you know, we have to pay out of pocket for our surgery. So there was no way I could afford a brain scan, but I really, we need a doctor, a a brain doctor, like, you know, whoever does the scans, those kind of doctors, we need one that will team up with us so we can prove something is seriously happening with women mentally when they have these breast implants and not everybody, but um, but when you do react and it comes down on you, it was the darkest abyss I have ever been in my life. And now I'm perfectly fine. So where did it go? You know, I mean, I always had PMS my whole life, but this was beyond, this was beyond, you didn't even, I didn't even want to live. It was so bad. And, and then the next day you could be perfectly fine. 
so I think I think I would love to get down to the root cause of what's causing the, you know, or but um, let's see if I'll try to find another answer or question for you. Oops, and it just jumped. So hang on. Um, why isn't the FDA letting all the doctors know about breast implant illness? Why won't they send the letter to all specialties? It would save women from going to doctor to doctor with no an answers. I have 33 year old Dow Corning implants. The doctor never said a word about the implants already being considered dangerous. A year later, they were taken off the market and class action was won. The surgeon assured me I had no problems and never had to touch them. Yeah, that's very common. Um, I hope I I hope people see this, women see this, husbands love their wives. Uh, I hold it, I had a surgeon tell me the capsules don't need to be removed. A lot of surgeons um, will tell women that they're intentionally leaving the capsules behind because you'll you'll have a bre better shape to your breasts post up and, and it's a big lie. I mean, you might have a better looking shape, but you're gonna be very sick possibly. Um, it's clear indication that a surgeon doesn't believe the women when they keep operating and implanting. Okay, um, I'm not a question yet, but we'll get there. Implant tissue and inflamed tissue must be removed. Dr. Khan, do you do consultation from a distance or do we have to absolutely be seen in your office? I'm in Montreal, Quebec, Canada, but I don't trust the surgeons I've seen. Well, I'd have to say, since you're doing people from all around the globe now, because you've done several from around the world, that you are you must be video conferencing with them first, possibly? Yes, so I do a phone consultation. And then uh, if I need more information, I do request that. Uh, uh, but a phone consultation is a very good, healthy way to start. I'm able to get a lot of information. Sometimes I do ask for the pictures so that I can see what may be a double bubble deformity or problem, for example, that may be present. Um, and uh, so this is where, you know, I'm so blessed uh, to say that I've had patients that I've taken care of from Qatar, from Saudi Arabia, from Japan, Germany, like today's patient was from the Netherlands, from Panama, from Egypt, uh, and again, all the states uh, of the US. Uh, and, you know, they come to me, they buy their day without even talking to me, without right. even the phone consultation. And I'm so blessed and lucky that, you know, I, I have this bond with my patients. And I'll tell you, that means the world to me. And I tell each and every single patient that I do this 100% from my heart. There is no other uh, uh, thing in my mind other than to help the patient. From a financial perspective, I was very happy even before, uh, if you ask me, I started medicine. Um, and so that was never an issue. That is not an issue and there will never be an issue. I could have retired long time ago and be very happy. Uh, you know, and again, the finances certainly are important because this is what's driving. I have a friend of mine who is the nicest guy who goes to missions to Nepal, for example, and you know, other parts of the Honduras. But when I asked him, why are you putting in implants? And he said, well, someone has to do it. And that is not a good enough of an answer. Implants only hurt the body as we talked about uh, so many points. Uh, it is not worth it and you should do no harm. Do not harm the patient. That is the, the ultimate goal uh, of a plastic surgeon. Does your pathologist look for silicone? Yes, yeah, so that's a very good point. Now remember silicone, sometimes are crystals. So if you look at the pathology report that I posted on Monday and Tuesday this week, you will see the pathologist clearly mentioned breast implant particles. Now, sometimes the particles cannot be seen or these bifringent uh, crystals, for example, so they may not be picked up because remember, they're looking for cancer, breast cancer, squamous cell, abnormal cells, histocytic cells, um, giant cell reaction. Now, in order to look for silica, which is dust, sand, right? You have to have electron microscopy, which is looking for silicon or energy dispersive x-rays. So you have different tools, not a microscope, not stains. So that is a different lab. So for example, Dr. Atul Mehta out of the Cleveland Clinic, he did a lung biopsy on a patient with intact saline implants. Or Dr. Henry Dykeman, who did a cadaveric study of a patient who had a rupture of silica implant, both of these biopsy samples were sent to a special lab where they did electron microscopy and energy dispersive x-rays to look for 
these particles. So this one patient who had saline implants that I removed intact, I sent the implants via FedEx to the Netherlands to Dr. Henry Dijkman, who took the saline out and then centrifuged the saline out of the saline implant and collected what was a pellet. And he showed under electron microscopy that there was silicon within the pellet itself consistent with silicon that was leaching from an intact saline implant. And wow. this is, if it's going into the saline, it's going into the rest of the body. And this is where I was mentioning the UCLA scientists are looking for a lab test to look for silicon. I will tell you, you don't need to do a test because there is gel bleed that's occurring from day one. And the even if the small amount of silicon is picked up, the goal is to remove all of this, uh, the, the entire capsule plus the implant bead saline or silicone such that none of this leaches into the body. Right. Is it true using infrared light treatment is dangerous when you have implants? So I will tell you, people go through all sorts of lights. This infrared light uh, has not been shown to be dangerous uh, from what I understand. Uh, this is, remember, a, uh, uh, the, there is no correlation in any medical literature that proves that this light hurts or ruptures or causes damage to the implants. Okay. So many surgeons and or MRI facilities are demanding contrast dye for checking for rupture only. Unacceptable. That is correct. So if you want to look for a rupture on a silicon implant, you have to do an MRI without contrast. To uh, doing it with contrast, you're looking for cancer for malignancy. My breast implants have been leaking, disintegrating for over three years now, and I'm still on a waiting list for my explant at the hospital. I'm allergic to anesthesia. Oh my gosh. And I already have a collapsed lung. So many surgeons in private clinics that I have consulted don't want to touch me due to this. Can you handle her? So when you have a collapsed lung, we need to know why, right? That is not healthy. Now you certainly, if you have a collapsed lung, you have another lung. I, I operated on a patient who actually had a pneumonectomy, which means one lung was completely gone. And she was living off a young lady in her thirties, late thirties, a uh, young mom that came to me from the Dominican. She was just living off of one lung. People can do that, but we need to know why, what are these allergies, and you absolutely need to be done at the hospital, and they need to do a complete reason. Just this week, uh, I, I took care of, uh, uh, last week, on Monday, I saw my patient post up day number four. At age 27, she had what was a respiratory arrest in the recovery area back uh, uh, when she was 27, 14 years ago. Now, this was a complication of a young, you hear about this, right? Maybe that was not a certified facility. This was a patient, Dr. Razvi, her primary care doctor cleared her and okayed for her to come to me. And I looked at, my anesthesia team looked at, and for the last 14 years, she had no cardiac issues and she was in her late 30s. Now, the point here is that she met criteria to get the surgery done safely in my surgery center, which is an outpatient facility. Now, uh, the last few patients that I did, she had two stents in her heart and an open heart surgery. That's the one I did on a Monday at the hospital. Another lady I did almost six weeks, seven weeks ago, she was on five liters of oxygen. And there are many patients that I've done at the hospital who meet criteria to be done safely at the hospital. Another 42 year old, she had metastases to her neck from breast cancer. And she indeed had a ruptured implant. A young mom, and I was reluctant to do her at all, but because of her exam, and because of the pain she was having, I said, we have to take the risk versus benefits. Wow. Wow. And she has to be done. So this lady, she has to go and she has to be done at the hospital and a surgeon who's going to remove all of the capsule and not compromise her recovery by saying, well, she's so sick. I'm just going to go in and out and remove. Look at that one patient that you and I were involved with. She was in the ICU here at a major hospital in Detroit area. Oh, and yeah. her surgeon, board certified, chose to do it by the bedside, if I'm not mistaken, or a quick run. And he the, was gonna, yep, they were gonna. 
yeah, in the ICU, but they ended up going to the merge to the operating room quick in and out. And then they used what is an argon beam, right? Which is unheard of. I've never heard this where they could blasted the capsule with a special heat, which they use for the liver. And I've never heard that before, which again, uh, the point here is it needs to be done right. Right. Yeah. Um, Gail says, if this issue affected men's testicles, you could be darn sure the information would get out and the implant would become illegal. Well, actually, Gail, um, men are getting them and they're also putting them in dogs and the dogs unfortunately can't tell their owners that they are sick from them, but it's coming. Just give them time to react to one, them. One thing I want to do is, you know, look, Tracy, with Robin, you and I talking, all the ladies, get your cell phones out and just gently, humbly professionally talk about your right to the FDA. You know, we heard from Robin yeah. over 400,000 complaints, you know, at least that's written, right? Now, document, right? Now, this is where, what are we seeing today? The FDA is not doing much. It's very passive being politically correct. The plastic surgeons are not talking much. The general practitioners, family medicine, rheumatology, allergy, none of them are truly talking because they're saying it's safe. The manufacturers certainly are not doing anything about it. And the patients are now talking to the other patients. And this is basically what's raising the awareness where now this is no longer the number one procedure. And what I want each one of you to do is reach your other fellow sister and let them know that this is what is breast implant illness. It is very much real. And that they, with an open mind, non-biased, make a decision for themselves with no outside forces, no significant others calling the shots. And then you take ownership of your own health in your own hand and very assertively and politely reach a decision that benefits you because you are the the victim and you're the beneficiary of the removal of the implant in a very certain definitive way. Mm. I had my explant and only had 75% of the capsule removed. Should I have the other 25% removed? I'm sorry, can you say that again, Tracy? I had my explant and only had 75% of the capsule removed. Should I have the other 25% removed? So good question. I will tell you this. There is, I have read so many operative notes from these surgeons who stated I removed almost all. I go back in, 90% of the capsule remains behind. So this 7525, I question if this is even real. Number two, uh, remember if she has, number one, go to the doc, make sure your thyroid is good. All those other tests are good. You don't have lupus, rheumatoid, whatnot else. All these other organic causes of problems ruled out. Number two, how much are you affected by what is breast implant illness or the residual capsule problem? How many sign symptoms do you have on that checklist from fatigue, brain fog? Look at the lady that came today from the Netherlands that I operated on. She is 29. She cannot function. She has a full job, but now she cannot get out of bed. Brain fog, fatigue, joint pain. She said, I cannot live like this. I have to do something. I told her, you have three choices. Now she had already gone to her doctor and the doctor said, everything's fine. I do not know what the problem is. You got the implants out, what's your problem? She had three choices. Number one, do nothing, pray to God and hope for the best, which is, you know, you rely on faith. Number two, do patchwork. Take some steroids, muscle relaxants, antidepressives, uh, you know, the steroids to calm the inflammation down. And number three, Take that definitive move where you get the residual capsules removed by a surgeon who is an expert in residual capsules, who sincerely believes into removing all the capsules and any inflamed tissue and sending it off. And then anticipating and hoping that this is the last and best option after you have exhausted all these other avenues. Okay. Which is exactly what my patient did today. Do you still have time for more questions? I don't want to. Yeah, yeah, no, no, please, okay. no, no, please go ahead. Yeah. Why do so many become sensitive to chemicals after explanting, me included? That was from Heidi. So why do they become sensitive? Uh, now, I will tell you, what is breast implant illness? Breast implant illness is where the body itself recognizes the implants and goes on overdrive, becomes hyperactive immune system. Now, it's like you have a cold, 
And remember how you're worn out, tired, even though you slept 10 hours and you're still tired and you're like fatigued, right? Because your body is on immune overdrive. Now, when it's on overdrive, it becomes more sensitive to what it may not have been in the past. Now, this is where I'm just putting the two and two together as this has been shown, where now the patient, before she ate ice cream her whole life or cheese, now all of a sudden she has sensitivities to bleed, for example. So now some people have sensitivities as well. The point here is because of that overdrive, now the patient becomes much more sensitive to what in the past they could tolerate. Now, this needs to be studied, investigated. And if you ask me, this is an immunological problem, a histiocytic reaction, a reaction to an overreaction to what would be a normal stimulus, for example, that the body itself would be able to accommodate. Now it cannot. Be it, be it the gut be it the smell, uh, you know, or maybe a smell that before used to trigger a small headache now triggers a migraine, for example. But again, this needs to be studied. I, I had terrible issues with chemicals and foods, and I'm four and a half years post-op, and it's taken all of the four and a half years to become less sensitive. I still can't wear perfume. My husband can't wear cologne. It, when I was pregnant, I was extremely sensitive to scents and stuff. And, um, but it's, it's so bad. Like if, like my friend even put hand lotion on when I was driving the car and I, I was just like, what, what have you done? And I had to pull over and make her go in and wash her hands and I could still smell it. I was just, I said, my lungs just felt like they just, <gasps> it's, it's in it. And I was never like that before I got breast implant illness. So yeah, it's it's pretty common. It's a pretty common complaint amongst all the um, all the support pages. And I think that was our last question, unless I missed any of them. But I think that was our last one, Dr. Khan. I think you this was one of our most wonderful ones, I think, ever. And I just want to say, because you're so passionate, I didn't even get to introduce you because you're so passionate. But I just want everyone to know that um, I think I met you like, what, four, four and a half years ago. Yes. And I started a support page in Michigan um, on Facebook because when I explanted, there was only two doctors. One of them, um, I had never even heard. Well, I didn't hear of any, either of them, but I ended up going to Costa Rica because I didn't know. And so my whole point, I wasn't trying to reinvent the wheel by um, starting a support group. My, my main purpose of my support page is to find doctors in Michigan. And we started out with two and now we have 12. But you came four, four and a half years ago. I didn't have a clue who you were. And um, I wanted to put you on my support page. But you know, the women, I, I get it, they, you know, they feel like they can't um, voice concerns or something, you know, so I suggested you start your own support page and you had, I checked the other day, you had over 8,000, almost 9,000 people on your support page here in Michigan. So you have quickly become one of the top two. There's two of you that are the most popular in Michigan and you are one of them. And, and when I saw your support page, just skyrocket to over 8,000 women. I hope people realize that just in the state of Michigan. I'm not saying everybody on your support page is only from Michigan, but we're being told that this is this is just a small amount of women. But if if anybody who's listening goes on Facebook, you type in breast implant illness, you'll see all the different support pages. Just look at how many people, and these are all women, are and some of them have men on them too. These look at the amount of people who have joined these support pages who are sick or in the dark and, and didn't know. And we're being told that this is a small percent. And I totally disagree. And I think it's a silent epidemic. Yes, no, absolutely. Very well said. Now, I just want to mention, you know, if you look at my practice and let's look at any of the top 10 or other explant surgeons, I will tell you each one of us has a unique way of doing it. Yes, you're all different, different. way mm -hmm. where I will challenge the other surgeon and say, why is it and how is it that this is being done by you in a way where I question, for example, the lift is being done along with an explant in three hours, where I myself take four hours on average for every case that I book. Now, having said this, 
I want each and every single patient, not only to talk to one, but talk to three, four, look at and understand, talk to the previous patients, because that's where you, all your answers are gonna lie. This is where you ask the patients and you go and dwell into what is the surgeon thinking, how is he or she doing it? And then you make that sound decision where you're content. Some ladies have taken six months, some three years to make a decision. This is where you wanna do it once, you wanna do it right, and you wanna do it with that peace of mind and confidence that your surgeon did the darn best job the goal of removing all implant capsule and all inflamed tissue and doing a complete workup where the capsule was looked at, the cultures were taken, implants were retarded, pictures were done to show complete removal. And the patient also has what is a good aesthetic ultimate re result. And that is what is explant surgery. I, wa I wanna say, I agree with everything Robin said when she was saying goodbye to you and, and she was patting you on the back. And I agree a hundred percent with everything that she said. I think you are a saint walking this earth with us. You are, you are really incredible. The way you spent your own money to warn women, you do Facebook lives constantly, constantly. I know of no other, I've seen other doctors doing Facebook lives, but I don't see them doing them all the time like you and dedicating all their time. You've dedicated your own money and it's constant time that you dedicate to us and we all appreciate it. And I'm sure there's women out there that really want to thank you. And I'm going to thank you for them because we no, really, no, thank you. really no, I will tell you appreciate it. Pleasure you. is mine. It's and, a privilege to do something what is right and an honorable and, you know, history will only prove Tracy and Robin and I, we did our best from our heart, sincerely. You know, tomorrow morning, you're gonna receive so many phone calls. You told me about this one patient, I think three weeks ago, she went to her, and I'll end with this. This is a lady, she went to her plastic surgeon and she ended up finding out later she had what was BILCL. And now she has to go back get the residual capsule removed. And now she has to go to a medical oncologist, uh, get secondary surgery, likely remove the implants plus the capsule. And now she has to go undergo another surgery and now to deal with the cancer that could indeed have been avoided. Are this you talking the about the, the one gal? Yes, yes, yes. And you okay, ended up- Okay, so I'll yeah. just explain to people. I can't tell you who she is you know, her privacy, but she messaged me and, and what caught my eye was she had her breast implants um, exchanged, um, replaced with a new set. I don't, I don't remember the reason why, um, but when the doctor opened her up, he found all kinds of, um, uh, what was it, um, cysts and then a seroma. And what did he cauterize the cysts or something? And then he left the seroma and said he put the implant in a little differently so it wouldn't hit the seroma. He didn't even deal with it. And then put the implants in on top and thought, you know, things don't look quite right. So he sent it to pathology, but still put a brand new set of implants in to get his money. And then it came back from pathology. Now she's got these new implants and pathology came back that she's got BIAALCL, the man-made cancer of your immune system. So now she's got this brand new set in. She already had the cancer before he put that new set in. And so that's what you're talking about. Is that the yes, gal? Yes, that's, you know, and now, and she, and now she doesn't have enough money to even get them removed and, and, be, and they're refusing, insurance is refusing to pay. That is so sad and wrong in yes. so many ways. Yeah. Now this so is where- not realize what we go through. Yeah. And you know, her treatment with the chemo and whatnot else is going to be upwards of a quarter of a million, if not more, if you ask me. Um, and uh, this is just walking into the major hospital because that's where she needs to be taken care of. Mm -hmm. Chemotherapeutic agents, very likely she'll need to do that with the medical. And again, remember, this has to be done at major medical centers of the U.S., not at a small community hospital. And now uh, this is this is what we're talking about. This is the awareness. Uh, it was uh, you know, uh, the red flag, a seroma, any fluid collection on the chest is cancer till proven otherwise, because it is, is abnormal to have a fluid collection, uh, oh. especially when not checked, you know, and this is where it is 
important and is uh, malpractice to not check. And I'll say those words because that is the right thing to do. Now, this is, you know, I find this talk very, very informative. If you listen to what Tracy and Robin and I talked about with an open mind, you should have no doubt that the implants are horrible devices. Shockingly, surprisingly, and sadly and shamefully, they're still being put in on a day-to-day -day basis as if there is no problem with them. And I feel optimistically in my mind that that day is not far. Hopefully the FDA will step up and ban these devices. I'm optimistic. Uh, I will continue and I request my plastic surgery colleagues to stop augmenting and to talk about explantation and to do the right thing and speak in the masses so that we can speak on behalf of the many patients who are hurting, who will only hurt, and that we can prevent this epidemic, pandemic, or whatever you call it, yeah. um, such that the patients don't have to get hurt. And it's not only the patients, but the significant other, the sons and daughters, the neighbors, the, 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 the society as a whole, so that we can save our uh, our fellow uh, beings, if you will. I call it a silent epidemic because I have friends who have them and they don't appear to be reacting. But what I tell them is you don't appear to be reacting. You could be silently getting one of these two cancers. And that's, that's just such a big concern. And I've always, I've always stood my ground because I'm a don't tread on me kind of person. You know, if you want to smoke cigarettes, do it. You want to ride with, without a helmet on, whatever. And I always say, you know, why would I stand in the way of another woman getting breast implants and take that away from her when she may not react? But after September, when I heard about the, the uh, squamous cell uh, cancer and 43% were dead within six months, it's the first time I'm going to say on the record, I absolutely think breast implants should be banned now. I, I'm tired of, I, I mean, I don't want to tread on anyone. I I just, in my heart and in my soul, I've always thought they, sh they should be banned, but I've always said, you know, do your thing, but I really, truly, truly feel they should be banned again. Mm -hmm. No, I agree with you. Do no harm. Yeah. That's the oath. That's the oath. Yep. Thank you, Dr. Khan. I think you're just really a really special human being. Thank you. No, no, I appreciate it. No, thanks for those kind time. words. No, no, thanks again for those kind words. I'll just say this, I'm just doing my job uh, and I do it from the bottom of my heart. Well, that's not true. You go above and beyond doing your job. No, I don't see any other surgeon dedicating all their time like this and, and you're always so gracious. So I really appreciate you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Take care. Have a good night. Thanks to okay. everyone. Good night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.